welcome to Pop Dish Presents and welcome actually back. Uh, I believe rumor has it that a few years ago you had spoken to uh, to one of our hosts. So it's lovely to have you here again. Time flies. Thank you. It's awesome to be with you guys again. Really happy that you could be here. There's a ton going on in, in your career. Uh, I understand that there is some projects that are coming up. What are your what are your plans? Well, um, I am dropping my next single. It's called Ode to Hustle, um, and that drops in early February. I have a documentary about my life that was in partnership with Bulgari that's coming out in Tribeca Film Festival. I believe that's slated for the end of this month. And then I have my full EP dropping at the end of February. So, you know, even though it's, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, um, there is a lot still happening. It's just so cool how my team has been able to keep things moving forward and being able to put out music and record and do all those things. And um, I'm feeling really grateful. That's absolutely excellent. Uh, and yeah, you've you've stayed busy. Um, you've got like a ton of videos up and songs that you've done that are like on your Twitter and YouTube. Yeah. Um, really cool to see. I suppose, you know, I'm sure that you probably miss the the crowds and whatnot of of live performance but you're still able to get out there with your uh, and create content to share with fans yes yes and honestly it's you know it's interesting i miss the live performance aspect so much but i'm finding that there is a lot of connection that can happen virtually and you know it's just i'm so grateful to my my community of fans and supporters and you know these interviews is just more ways to connect with people even though we can't do it physically so Ah, 2021, hopefully things will pick up, right? We had a rocky start, but... <laughs> what do you mean? It's been totally smooth. Rocky start, but things are looking up, right? <laughs> totally peaceful transfer of power. <laughs> is, that, is that why you're in, in Mexico right now? Where you just like, oh. I need space from... Uh, when it comes to connecting with fans or just things that you're doing to occupy time you know, in quarantine and everything else? Are there are there certain things in particular, maybe new hobbies or guilty pleasures? In taking classes, actually, um, in this time, um, which has been super, super cool. I've been going back to school. I've been going to Berkeley in Boston um, and, you know, getting another degree in film composition and TV writing. So writing music for like TV and film and commercial. And that's been a really cool thing, which I would have never done in my normal life just because I didn't have the time. Wow. Um, also, I made an online curriculum for violin students um, that's all virtual. And that took that's something a passion project I wanted to do for a long time. But again, it's like when you actually get the time to stop and sit down and not be on the go all the time you can actually achieve some of these things that you wanted to you know put out so i did that that's kind of been it was there like um i'm guessing maybe a lot of people had reached out to you for like lessons or you just realized that you know there's you wanted to be able to spread the skills yeah well you know i have a my foundation it's called heartstrings foundation and um we were slated to launch actually fall of 2000 and 20 but you know thing you know with everything that happened it just wasn't really realistic for me i love education so much and i love connecting with children i love using my platform and my skills to bring more black and brown children into the classical space so for me education is just it's like one of the pillars of what i do and what i love and because i'm not able to physically connect i decided to make ways to virtually do this so um, basically, I've created a curriculum where students can take lessons, um, you know, they can learn how to read music, they can learn how to hold the instrument, learn like basic skills. And then with that, making an online community for them to also connect. And so that's been something that I was able to bring to life because of this pandemic. And, you know, I think COVID has really changed, will forever change the way that we do a lot of things, right? Like, I think virtual is going to be used more, unfortunately, like, I don't think anybody wants to Zoom anymore, but there are some benefits, right? Like you can just do things quickly. You can do sessions remotely. You can do all these things. You don't have to fly across the country to do it, right? It's, it is pretty cool. Um, but I just wanted to apply that to education and to, you know, creating more impact. Yeah, that's awesome. And there are definitely, you know, some benefits, including the fact that, you know, for us at Pop Dust, a lot of times if we wanted to, you know, have like this sort of face-to-face -face or on-camera interview, we just had to hope that they were happening to come through New York City. Right. And now 
you know, I've done like several sessions with artists like in other countries. We're all like a little less connected, but even more connected. Yeah, it's like this strange paradox, right? It's like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so, but that's cool though, that like, you're not only um, working towards, you know, advocating for and providing uh, education out there and in such like an incredible arena, given that it's, you know, the arts and giving people like the skill that could um, be really fulfilling for them in a, in a ton of ways. And in the case of yourself, uh, be a tremendous career path. What's like the biggest difference or, or something that, that really struck you even after having like a successful music career, now going to school for writing for, for television and film? Is there something that like, you know, you've, you've learned or, or you're starting to, to see that's just like really that different? Because I would have assumed, you know, hey, she's really, really super, you know, talented. And if you're able to, you know, whip out the violin and, you know, create an awesome track on like WAP, then yeah, you can do this like McDonald's commercial. Why not? <laughs> And you know what got me into wanting to even like take classes and go back to school for this in the first place was having the opportunities to work with clients and score stuff or work on short films or work on documentaries. I just love writing for media so much. And, you know, I think something that I always remember is there's always more to learn. There's always room to be a beginner again, a beginner again, right? There's always, and I think especially when you for me, because I know the violin so well and I know what I do so well, um, I just like the challenge of like, let's learn something new, right? That's really cool and pretty inspirational that you're like, yeah, I know I want to keep learning and finding, you know, cool ways of doing that. Is it is it this month? Is it right now that you're on the cover of Strings magazine? Yes, which is so surreal because, you know, I grew up reading that magazine, right? Like I, I've been like obsessed with the violin my whole life. And I remember like being in middle school, being in high school and like looking at the cover and I'll never forget the year that Esperanza Spalding, the amazing jazz bassist who actually went to Berkeley, her, she was on the cover and she's, you know, a woman of color. She had this huge fro and her bass and I just like held the cover, like I held the magazine. My eyes were just wide, like, oh my God, she's, and you know, I was like, I was young. I was probably 14 or something like that. I don't know, just when they reached out to me and they were like, and we'd like for you to be on the cover. I just, like for, for some reason, this one really hit, right? Like there are all sorts of achievements that we have in our lives, but some really hit home because for me, this the nostalgic aspect of it. Um, so it's been so cool and it's been really awesome to connect with people through this cover. Like my old professors have been reaching out, my old like, like violin teacher when I was like four reached out, you know, it's just, Everybody who plays the violin, like in the classical or violin space, we read this magazine. Do you have any do you have any old teachers that you're like, yeah, look at me now? Well, you know, not really. I I had amazing teachers, period. Um, I will say I remember my first lesson with one of my teachers. Um, her name was Mrs. Miyato. She I was probably three years old. I was really I was really sleepy in the lesson, right? Like I kept like kind of like nodding off like that type of thing. And she grabbed me by the ankles and put me upside down. And my dad, who was like super strict, like Caribbean parent was like, oh, she's great. Like we like this. My mom on the other hand was like, like just terrified. Like what are you doing to my daughter? You know, like that would never happen today, right? This was back in the nineties. It was the nineties. What a what happened. <laughs> you know, when, yeah, when Will Smith said my life was flipped, turned upside down, he was talking about his violin teacher. Literally. I mean, I woke up, I never fell asleep in a lesson again, period. Still strikes me as odd. I know you had, I had heard in, in other interviews of yours that you had started playing when you were like three. I didn't know that that was a thing. I'm not sure that I could walk at three. I mean, you know, the amazing thing about young children is that because they're so like blobby, right? they're actually at like the, the perfect space to learn to play an instrument because you can just kind of like mold them and you know, they just kind of sit there and like they're, they have these like chubby cheeks that just like hang out over the violin and they're just like, like this, they're not even really thinking about it, if that makes sense. It's just, their brains are so quickly absorbing language. They're learning like social, like all of this stuff that they're learning just to add an instrument is really nothing for them. 
not everybody needs to start when they're three. Like that's kind of, that can be a little excessive. I think five or six is great. Um, but yeah, I just, I just asked to play and my parents, you know, had no idea that a three-year-old could do anything. Um, and they just like got me a little violin and I just was pretty natural at it. So that's kind of how that all happened. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they're not overthinking anything and even if they're not like able to play well, I suppose even just at that young of an age, like just to have contact with like the strings and everything yeah. and feel like, like later in life that just might seem, might come easier to them. You know, my first violin I, I was actually a, a violin called a cake box violin. So I had like a, it was like a box of cake or you could use like a box of macaroni and cheese, right? And we wrapped it, I had like a ruler. So it was like a fake violin basically, like it looked like a violin, but it was made from a box, if that makes sense. And um, that was just because I was so young that you don't know if the violin could break, all of these things. Um, so I played on that for a few months, actually. And then I moved on to like a real violin, which is just such a big deal. Popular violins, I think, are much more popular in classical music in general than like you would think when you're just like browsing, you know, the top 40 charts or something. But like so many people grow up playing violin. Is that exciting? Yeah. Does it mean that there's a lot of competition? I mean, yeah, it's a very competitive instrument just because it is so hard and so many people play it. So it's like, you know, any sort of um, skill sport or something like that. I don't know, tennis maybe, right? Where there's just a lot of skill required and a lot of people play, but not everybody gets to have access to play, right? So if you do get to play tennis, like you're very fortunate, right? To have access to a court, to the rackets, to all that stuff. So it is a very competitive sport space and there are a lot of people play but there also isn't as much access as I would like to have in the in the classical world you know for me be you know growing up in conservatory and everything of course there's com is competition like you know just like the drum before auditions and all that stuff or like you know you know sitting next to somebody and and they're like trying to play like faster than you and louder than you know that type of like competitive stuff but for me because I've kind of made my own space um I don't really feel the need to com compete with anybody. I just honestly just want to compete with myself. I know it sounds really corny, but I think as you find your own voice, it's less about what other people are doing and more just about staying true to you and staying authentic to who you are. Um, but yeah, definitely when I was in school, oh my God, like it was, it was crazy, like how competitive it would be, right? And, um, you know, like cut people cutting like horse hair and like all this crazy stories of, popping strings before an audition, like on purpose to mess them up, so. Are there any movies about that? Cause we have like the bring it on movies, like the cheerleading competitions. They have that for violins with like people cutting each other's strings and everything. Like the catty behavior. I mean, they should make a movie about it to be honest. It would be fascinating, I right? I don't know who can do the soundtrack cause she's going to school for, for writing for film. Yeah, the soundtrack. Well, what you said about like access to it, I think is definitely an, an interesting point because it's probably great, you know, other thing that, you know, with your foundation, for example, I really like cello, right? And I always like I want to learn cello, but there was never like a cello sitting around and nobody's ever like, yeah, like try my cello and you can't go to like guitar center and like play the cello. Meanwhile, guitars, they basically hand them out when you're a teenager. I Everybody's, you know, so it's just important for people to one know that it's an option, right? Like I think some people don't even realize that even the guitar is an option. You know, they don't live in a space or in a community where perhaps that's something that they would even have access to, right? Yeah. Then you know, then you have the violin. You know, it's just I think first it's just that awareness that you know these instruments exist that this music exists and all that stuff and then the next step is actually making it possible for people to get an instrument to take lessons um and i think we have the classical space has a lot of work to do in that department um i think they are making necessary strides um to kind of just make a space where the pool of people who are involved in playing is just more diverse and more um accessible for more people. I do get lots of emails from kids, you know, a lot of like young kids who are, you know, an orchestra and they're like, you know, thank you so much. Like I, I didn't know somebody who looked like me also played the violin, right? And that just means a lot to me to know that my work as 
you know, as maybe niche as it is, is really helping some somebody out there. Like that means a lot. Yeah, that is that is huge. Um, you know, we're focused on and you know, sensitive to the, the access that mm -hmm. may not exist, and then also you know, kind of providing that example and like engagement. I think a lot of you know the stuff that you do where you're playing along with you know like the hottest new songs and everything that they might hear on the radio and then might be engaging where they're like, wow, like that sounds so cool to have like the violin, you know, on, on this song or, or that song. And like, you know, I'd, I'd want to do that too. So encouraging that and having like, um, yeah, I don't know, providing that like representation as well, because I think classical music for sure can have like, stuffy vibe to it just in the just in the fact that like when i think classical music i think like juilliard and things and like and it's nothing wrong with that but it's just like it's this uh it almost it almost feels like just like very uh great barriers of entry for whatever reason because it's so uh prestigious and whatnot music shouldn't doesn't need to be like wine right like i think for i know some people who like you know when they get all these wine options or wine lists they kind of freeze up because they don't maybe know the differences between like a Sauvignon Blanc and like a Cabernet, right? Like, but I feel like music, which is so generous and really just a human and soul connection, there shouldn't be that type of fear or anxiety, like, am I good enough? Am I knowledgeable enough? Am I cultured enough, right? Like, it's just music. And if we look at, you know, Beethoven for his time, like, he wasn't writing to be this prestigious thing. He was just making the pop music at the time. So... That's something that I always bear in mind. You know, I think we've kind of classical music today has lost touch with what it truly was like hundreds of years ago. And that was exciting, fresh music that was written and then they forgot about it, right? Like the idea of studying now what was written like 150 years ago, they weren't doing that. You know, they were just playing. That didn't happen until later. Yeah. Uh, so it is interesting. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think if we can just break down those barriers and just grant people more access and you know that starts with kids right and um acceptability so you mentioned beethoven is he like one of your favorites then had such a prolific life that you kind of see his evolution um you know from his first quartet to his late quartet like when he right before he died he was writing stuff that sounded so modern and crazy for the time when people didn't know how to react right so he's definitely somebody i admire and um you know, when I imagine Beethoven, I don't think he was trying to fit the trends. He was just being himself. You know, he was also deaf, so maybe that was a part of it. <laughs> like, uh, but um, he was deaf to the critics, right? He just did his thing, and I, and I admire that so much. Are there are there people like contemporary right now that uh that you have any collaborations planned with, or ones that you would really like to? I mean, I love Rosalia. I think she's amazing. I love how she kind of takes her flamenco style. Like, I just love that blending of style. You know, love James Blake. I love Max Richter, who's kind of more on the classical side. Oh my God, I'm obsessed with Anderson Pack. I, 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 there's so many people. Um, I just love music. Um, I love Earth Gang. They're so cool. So it's like a huge mix of things. It's like rap, it's um, pop, it's electronic, you know. So I just love, I love music. Definitely hope to talk to you again soon um yeah congrats on everything congrats on being on the cover of strings magazine and uh gonna be looking forward to this ep at the end of february thank you take care bye